Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. There's a good crowd of y'all out there today. Hey, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here at the church, and it's great to be with you guys. I've actually been in Guatemala for the last two weeks. I'll tell you a little about that in a second. But first, I don't know if you know this, but we have a vacation Bible school this week here at Crossroads for your kids. So if you have kids and you really, like me, want a break from them, you can dump them off here this week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> VBS is an awesome opportunity. I have so many good memories from VBS during the summer. And this is the first time we're actually doing a VBS ever. It's thanks to our amazing children's pastor, uh, Abby. Thank you, Lord, for Abby. Where's she at? She's not... I made her stand up in the first service, so I think she didn't come back because she knew I'd make her stand up. But uh, it's not too late to register your kids for that, so check out that. I think you can register on the app, so check that out. So, um, yeah, last week, or last two weeks, actually, I was in Guatemala, which many of you know I grew up in Guatemala, Central America, and it was really cool. The first day I was there, I actually got to speak at the church I grew up in, which was kind of cool. And I actually ran into a, fr- talked to a friend of mine who I did a radio show with when I was in high school. And he now has a morning TV show on the national station in Guatemala. You know, it's like, good morning, Guatemala. Good morning, America, or something like that. And he said, hey, I want to have you come on the show. And I was like, oh, that'll be really funny. He said, we can talk about your book that's been translated to Spanish. I have a book called Plenamente Tu, and it's been translated to Spanish. And uh, he said, so he sent me the date. And... It was going to be Thursday morning, and I, so I got, a, I got a taxi, took me to the station, and I showed up at this huge building. They've got a big fence around it, and my name was on a little list, and they opened the gate, and I came in. But when I got inside, nobody was there to meet me, and so I walked in the door, and um, there's this, it's a huge building, and I saw somebody. I was like, hey, I'm here. Uh, Roberto, my friend, is supposed to interview me on the show this morning. She's like, oh, Roberto's sick, but somebody will interview you. <laughs> Oh, wow. And it was a little nervous for me because, you know, I know Roberto. I understand kind of the speed he speaks at. And, you know, it was all in Spanish, right? So I was like, okay. And my, my Spanish is a little rusty. I haven't used it regularly on a regular basis that often. So they said, just go in here. So they, they run me into this room. It's this giant studio. And there's all this m- movement, right? There's all these lights and there's cameras moving over here. And there's a person doing a live show over here and somebody getting set up over here. They go to a commercial and then they shoot the camera over here. And I'm sitting on this couch just kind of watching all this go down. Nobody says a thing to me. I'm just, I don't know what I'm doing. And finally, about three minutes before my segment, this lady comes up to me and she's like, all right, what's your name? And I'm like, it's Joelle. And she's like, well, what are you, you going to talk about? I'm like, I, you're, you're, you're in charge of this show. I'm just here to be interviewed, right? And she said, well, what do you want to talk about? So I was like, well, I think you wanted to talk to me about this book. And they didn't know who I was from anybody. It's this guy and this lady. And um, so she, then she goes this. She goes, so a que te dedicas? What do you do? Like, what's your job? And I was like, well, I'm a writer. And she's like, okay, what else? And I was like, well, I'm a, I speak about the books I write. And she said, well, where do you speak? And I was like, well, I speak at churches and conferences. And she goes, so you're a pastor, now, if y'all know me, I do not like being called a pastor. So I was like, eh, I guess I'm a pastor. Yeah, I'm, I'm a pastor de enseñanza. I'm a teaching pastor. And she's like, ah, eres pastor. Okay. The whole interview, y'all, I got four segments. They're like, pastor, una pregunta. Pastor, pastor, pastor. And I was like, ah, it was like daggers through my heart every time they said it. But the interview went well. In fact, one of the cool things that happened is um, after the first segment, I, you know, they didn't know who I was. And I think they were like, why is this white guy on our, on our show here? But uh, after the, the first segment, one of the hosts, he te- he, he's like, you're never going to believe this. He said, a friend of mine who like just does not like church and he's so angry at God, he just texted me and he said, uh, and he said that... Um, he wanted to meet that gringo chapin, which means like the chapin is a Guatemalan, right? It's a slang word for Guatemalan. He's like, he wants to meet that gringo white, that white Guatemalan guy. Because he said it was really inspiring what he said in the first segment. He said it really spoke to me. And I was like, wow, okay, so it's working. So, you know, it was really cool immediately that, to know that at least somebody understood what I was saying on the TV somewhere. So, <laughs> anyways, it was, a, it was a really cool experience, but it's great to be back with you guys. We're going to continue our series today in... Um, Philippians, which we have been going through verse by verse. Now, the challenge with going through verse by verse is like Pastor Marcus will pick up a section and then I'll pick up a section. And this week, I listened to him last week from Guatemala. And when he wrapped it up, I'm like, okay, so what's the next section say that I'm going to speak about? And I read it and I was like, 
oh no, this is a really hard verse. And I had to be reminded of something that Paul says in 2 Timothy. That here's, he says this, blank. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Everything that's in the Bible has importance and relevance to our life. When I'm reading something, I've been reading the Bible for over 40 years now. When I read something that doesn't make sense to me, I have to believe that I'm the problem, not the Bible. I just don't have the understanding necessary yet to understand the profound depth of truth that is in that scripture. And so that's my encouragement to you this morning. If, you're, if you find yourself reading the Bible and going, what the heck is Paul talking about? Welcome to the club. I've been doing this for 40 plus years and I still don't understand a lot of what he's talking about. But we have to believe, I, I build my life on this, that the Bible is absolute foundational truth. And just because I don't understand it, it doesn't mean it's not something that's truth, true for me. And eventually one day I'll understand it. Maybe on the other time of the space time continue, side of the space time continuum when we're standing before God and we go, oh, that's that, what that weird verse was about. But all scripture is God breathed and no exception to what is going on with my thing here? There we go. No exception to today. And da-da, it works. Okay. So I started preparing the message. And uh, while I was preparing the message, I was reminded of a story of a guy I met when I was growing up in Guatemala, a little dude named Tomas. And the crazy thing about this is this passage, I started preparing the message this week, and I thought, man, I don't know what the real practical message is of this. And then yesterday, we saw that political violence, and I thought, you know what? The message that Paul shared in this line here that we're going to cover today is really the answer to bringing peace to the political divide, to the conflict in our country, if we will apply what Paul talks about today. So this guy, Thomas Gallego, Guzaro Gallego, I was a kid, I was only about 12 years old, and there was a guy, you know, I was a short little kid, but there was a guy who was actually shorter than me, this guy, Tomas. We worked in this village up in the mountains of Guatemala, and when we lived there, there was a civil war going on in the country. Back in the 70s, the Soviet Union was sending funds to communist insurgent guerrillas who were trying to overthrow the governments in Central America. If some of you know the stories of this different place in Central America, the communist government, uh, communist um, insurgent ar armies were trying to overthrow the governments. And there was one particular area where the fighting was really bad. It was in the northwest part of Guatemala called the Ixchil Triangle. And the Ixchil people were the Mayan descendants, and Tomas is one of them. And he's a short little dude. And what was crazy is when we'd be working up there, when the guy would walk into the room, he'd kind of shuffle in. He always had his hat. He was always smiling. Everyone had this deep reverence for this guy. And he, I mean, you would never know, like, who is this guy? And I started going, why does everybody respect this guy so much? Everybody's like, oh, that's Tomas, Tomas. Like, this guy's like a legend around here. Well, I found out his story one day. In the 70s, right as the guerrilla insurgency was starting to rise up and there was a lot of conflict and shooting going on in the mountains between the government and the guerrillas, the, the communist guerrillas, Tomas came to Christ and he started pastoring different churches in the area. Well, the communists, communism teaches there is no God, the government is God. They came to him and they said, hey, we're going to inscript all of your people into our communist insurgency and you've got to basically come on board with us or we're going to kill everybody. And Tomas said, we're not going to do that. We serve God and he's the one we listen to. And they, act, they actually ended up beheading Tomas's best friend. They killed him. It's very violent. And they said, this is what we're going to do to you next. We're coming after you and all the churches in the area. So Tomas started hiding and he hid in little houses, like in, in these villages and shacks for weeks on end, trying to avoid being caught by the guerrillas and made an example of like they had done to his best friend. And one day he had this realization. He's like, you know what? I can't keep living this way. I've got to come out of hiding. And if God wants to take my life, he'll take my life. If he wants to protect me, he'll protect me. And he came out and he said to the leaders of the church, guys, we're in danger we cannot bow our knee to this com these communists that are telling us we have to do what they say and join their insurgency. So let's fast and pray about what we should do. So they went into a time of fasting and praying. And in prayer, Tomas had a vision of a secret path through the mountains to escape from their village. Now, these guys, they've 
traipsed all the hills around their village. I mean, they're in these ginormous mountains all around them. They would know every path. But he, he had this vision and there's like a waterfall involved and this pond and all these things in it. And he went to the elders and he said, guys, I think I had a vision of an escape route. And they're like, well, that's really risky because all around us are guerrilla war fighters that want to kill us. If they find us trying to escape, they're going to kill us on the spot. And he said, I know. So he actually went that night and scouted it out. And as he scouted it out, everything that he had seen in his vision, he saw it physically on the path. So he came back and said, guys, I think God gave us like a secret path out of here. And they said, okay, but if, you know, if it doesn't work out, we're going to get killed because the gorillas are going to find us. So they told anybody that wanted to escape, meet, I think it was August 2nd, 1984, meet at the church at 8 p.m. right after the sun goes down and we're going to escape. They were counting on about 20 people being there and 227 people showed up, which kind of draws attention when you're trying to escape quietly. <laughs> so Tomas said, all right, Lord, here we go. So they started doing the trek and they followed that route. Well, they got to the top of the ridge and somehow the gorillas on the other ridge saw them and they started coming after them. They saw them coming down the hill and they just knew they were done. They're like, oh, we're found out. We're going to get caught. Out of nowhere, bombs started exploding between them and the gorillas. Years later, they found out that a mechanic in town had been taken up to fix a howitzer gun and he had just finished fixing it. And they're like, well, show us it works. He's like, well, you want me to just fire it? And they're like, fire it over there. There's nobody over there. And it just so happened he fired right between where the gorillas were about to kill these 227 Christians. Tomas led them to safety. He's like a modern day Moses in the middle of this insurgency. And the crazy thing is you would have never known that tiny little dude had that in him or that he had done that. And it got me thinking, you know, every one of us, we have people in our lives that God is doing some pretty amazing things in their life, but we just may not realize it or may not know it because every one of us is created in the image of God. And it's really crazy to think, but God loves the person sitting next to you just as much as he loves you. And he's doing a unique work in them just as much as he's doing a unique work in you. And it's easy to look and go, <laughs> Surely not them. Look how they're behaving. <laughs> Surely not anybody that votes that way. There's no way God's working in those people, but he is. And this is where we pick up what Paul says today. This verse that I looked at and I go, what in the world is this all about? But I think it's very relevant for where we're at right now, right here today on July 14th, 2024. Paul says this, Again, it's one of these things that you just read through and you're like, why is this inspired? But here it is. But I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. Now, Epaphroditus is an interesting name. It means son of Aphrodite. And Aphrodite was the god of sex and wine, like the party goddess of Greece. And, and, and uh, Eros was the, the, the Roman name for, for this goddess. My brother, the co-worker and fellow soldier. So obviously this guy had a, he came from a background that wasn't necessarily Christian, right? But God had redeemed it who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I'm all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy. And this is the line I want to focus on today and honor people like him. Because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. I want to look at this word honor because honor simply means respecting someone for the value that God placed in them. And I don't know about you, but I feel like people need to earn my respect. You want my respect? You better earn it. Prove to me you're worthy of my respect. But the crazy thing in the Bible is, it says that there are certain people in certain positions we're supposed to honor just because they're on earth. Now, I don't like that. You know, the worst part, it says we're supposed to honor our leaders and respect them. I'm like, well, some of our leaders are idiots. <laughs> but the Bible says you're supposed to honor them and respect them because of their position. It also says you're supposed to honor your father and your mother. That's a hard one because some of you go, man, my father did nothing worthy of honor. But we're called in the Bible to do hard things. 
Chesterton said, Christianity hasn't been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. When you get into this stuff God asks you to do, it's really hard. And one of the things that's really hard is to honor people. Now, I want to make a couple distinctions because we live in a world right now that's all about honoring people. But there's a very different thing between honoring somebody and honoring their dysfunction. You're never called to honor someone's dysfunction, but you are called to honor them as an image bearer of God. And it's very tricky because we have a lot of people in our world today that say, well, you only love me if you accept everything I feel about myself right now. And it may change tomorrow, but then you have to lo love me and accept what I feel about myself tomorrow too. You just have to accept everything about me, no matter what I do. That's not love. That's not love at all. In fact, I'm convinced you can't love somebody until you're willing to look at the negative traits and call, call and love them in spite of somebody's negative traits, but call greatness out of them and don't let them stay the way they are. That's what God does with us. He says, I love you, but you got a lot of change to do and I'm gonna help you do that. That's what true love is. And love isn't wholesale accepting everything about somebody because a lot of people have some really whacked out dysfunctional mindsets about sexuality, about philosophy. There's things that people believe that are just harmful and destructive to them. And we don't have to honor their dysfunction, but we do have to honor the fact that they are created in God's image and God is working in them. And I've told this before, but I, I've just throughout the years, I've talked to so many people that they tell me I left that church because they started judging me. And when I ask them, what do you mean by they started judging you? They say, well, you know, I, I was doing this thing and they said, I can't do that anymore. I said, were they judging you or did they see something in you you couldn't even see in yourself? because you've been so beat down by sinful lifestyle or people saying things to you, they were calling greatness out of you, but it was gonna require some change on your behalf. And you said, oh, they were judging me. They didn't love me just as I am. But love doesn't love you just as you, they, you are. Love takes you where you are, but says you're way better than this. And that's what honoring people means. You don't honor their dysfunction. If they've got a whacked out view that's unbiblical, you don't honor that. And, and the thing is, they're going to reject you and they're going to say, well, then you don't love me. But, but here's the thing. If you don't stay true to it, to the truth, and eventually they come around to the truth, they may come back to you and go, why didn't you tell me the truth at the time? Or if you affirm something that's dysfunctional and they harm themselves because of it, and then they come around and realize what they've done to harm themselves, then they say, why didn't you tell me the truth? Well, because I loved you. That's not love. So we, we, we live in this tough balance of how to honor people as image bearers of God, but also not honor their dysfunction. And that takes the Holy Spirit's guidance on how to do that. But you never compromise on truth. Another thing we need to honor, and this is messed up in our world today, is we don't honor those who came before us. For some reason, we think we're the smartest people who have ever lived on the face of the planet. And we look at people in the past and we go, yeah, they may have been smart, but that guy had a slave. He owned a slave. And listen, slavery is absolutely wrong and it's absolutely sinful. But did you know for most of human history, slavery was the norm? And so they lived in this culture where slavery was the norm. And, and here's the crazy thing. 200 years from now, some people are going to look at stuff we did and they're going to go, how could they have possibly know anything and thought that way? And yet we think we're so smart. How could they have eaten that junk food like that and thought it was okay? <laughs> There's going to be things that the culture, few, years ahead from now, they're going to look back and go, those people must have been idiots because we always think we're the smartest people that ever were. But the reason we have the freedom and liberty and time and Facebook to complain about it is because the people before us paid the price, right? And we need a little bit of humility to recognize they didn't get it all right, but neither do we. So we take the good that they gave us and we build on that and we tweak what's necessary. But if you got to rebuild after every generation, you're just destroying yourself, which is why I think he says, honor your father and mother that you may live long in the earth. Because when you honor them for what they brought to the table, even if they didn't get it right, you don't have to rebuild every generation. They learn some hard lessons that if you'll learn from them and not have to repeat them, you can actually go further than they did. And, and this is my key point this morning here. We honor God when we recognize his unique work in someone's life. Honoring others is actually a way of honoring God because every human is a unique expression of God. 
and his work in their life, the story he's working in their life is something unique. It's a unique expression of his redemptive work in this world. And when you come to know somebody's story, you have a lot more grace for why they believe the way they do, the way your wife, why your wife responds the way she does to certain things. You know that thing you do that you're like, why does she overreact every time I this? There's a good chance there's something in her story that triggers that. Your kids, family. And one of the most important things we can do is when we see people that frustrate us and drive us crazy, we go, what's their deal? Just instead of telling your side of the story, just shut up and say, tell me what's going on with you. And here's what you'll find. God will often use other people's stories to help heal your story. My translation is this. Someone else's survival story may become your survival manual. Every challenge you're facing right now, I absolutely believe that God has placed the people around you that can help you get through that challenge. If you'll stop focusing on yourself so much and start looking for God's work in other people and hearing the story of his work in their life, it will encourage you for your unique situation. Your marriage struggling right now? There are people around you who have been through marriage struggles and they've got stories on the other side of, of how God can redeem and restore and heal. But if you're all, always just focused on yourself and focused on talking about yourself and your problems and never listening to the stories of others, you're probably not going to find the healing you want because you've got to get involved in the stories and lives of others. And as you hear those stories, the redemptive work of God in their life, a unique expression of it, you'll find healing for your own story. C.S. Lewis, he said this, it's a pretty profound quote. He said this, the load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back. A load so heavy that only humility can carry it. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and circumspection. Circumspection is just kind of looking a little bit deeper at something or thinking about it a little more profoundly circumspection proper to them that we shall conduct all our deal that we should conduct all our dealings with one another all our friendships all loves all play and even all politics there are no ordinary people you have never talked to a mere mortal every person is infused with the image of God, a unique expression of who God is. And in their story, in their life, there's a unique work. And you look at them right now and you're like, man, but they're living so short of it. Maybe God's calling you to come alongside them and listen to their story and help heal that story. But you're not gonna do it by just yelling at them or getting mad at them for them not understanding. We only do it as we honor one another, recognizing the person next to me, God loves them just as much as he loves me. That guy on the platform for the political party we oppose. Yeah, even that guy. God loves him as much as he loves you and me. You see, but they're horrible people. Sometimes it's hard to find the image of God in some people. But if you look hard enough, you'll see it. So here's my challenge for you. Tomorrow when you go and face that boss that you can't stand, face that coworker that drives you crazy, Deal with your ex-husband, your ex-wife. Deal with your current husband, your current wife. Ask this question. What can I learn from this image bearer of God in front of me? And that's with humility we recognize, man, God's doing something in them. And sure, they're not all they could be, but thank God they're not what they used to be. And the same thing is true for you. You're not all you could be, but thank God you're not what you used to be. And he's doing his work. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So we honor the work of God in others' lives. And we think, well, they should be further along. Well, maybe they're saying the same thing about you. And as we have that humility to recognize that every person is an image bearer of God, even those people that believe that way or think that way or vote that way, and we recognize God's working in their story. And I don't necessarily agree with their conclusions, but I will honor the fact that God is working in them and loves them just as much as he loves me. And that humanizes everybody. And it gives us a lot more patience for people who believe differently than us, think differently than us, respond differently than us. But as we do that, I believe that's the only way we can come to unity. 
is as we honor those around us for the fact that they are image bearers of Christ and then just ask, God, what can I learn about you from the people around me, even the ones that frustrate me like crazy? You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you this morning that you are working in us to will and to act according to your good pleasure, as it says in Philippians, we read a couple weeks ago. I thank you that you're working in us. You who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. I pray that you just give us wisdom, every one of us in humility, Lord, to, to see the image of God in every person around us, even the ones that irritate us, and drive us crazy and make us angry. I pray that as we do that, Lord, you would bring that peace that transcends all understanding and it'll guard our hearts and minds for us and for our entire world and country. If you're here this morning, you've not given your life to Jesus. This is the first step in the process. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive those sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I'm gonna say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean in your heart, God is gonna come and forgive your sin, transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and set you up with him in eternity. It starts by saying this prayer. Let's, let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you back under that do it again sign. You guys, look at this. Four minutes early, I'm dismissing you, all right? You can credit it to me next week when we go over. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Y'all have a great week. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.